Welcome to the first session of the Disability and Philanthropy Forum's Journey to Inclusion series, brought to you by the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy and Borealis Philanthropy. My name is Emily Harris, and I use she, her pronouns. I come to you from the land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi Nations, now known as the City of Chicago. As part of our commitment to accessibility, our speakers and I will each provide a short audio description. I am a white woman with dark curly hair, wearing rectangular glasses and a black, gray, and white sweater. Behind me is a screen made of rectangles of blonde wood and white paper. A few housekeeping items for today's learning session. We have live captioning today. There are two ways to access these captions. Uh, next slide, please. Use the CC button at the bottom of your screen and choose subtitles or full transcript, which will pop up as a box on your screen within Zoom. We're also providing a full transcript through stream text if you prefer to access the captions in a sec separate window. The link to stream text will be in the chat. During our first 30 minutes, we will be spotlighting our speakers and you will be muted. Following the initial conversation, you'll be placed in a breakout room for 25 to 30 minutes to meet colleagues, discuss what you learned and identify questions for the panelists, which your facilitator will record. We will use the chat to share links to information and the chat is available to you if you would like to ask questions before or after the breakout session. You can also send questions to communications at disabilityphilanthropy.org. Please note that even if we run out of time today to answer your questions, they will be informing the resources we create on disabilityphilanthropy.org. Check back early and often. The Disability and Philanthropy Forum was created to support philanthropy's collective journey to disability inclusion. While most of our resources are open to the public, we wanted to create an opportunity for grant makers to candidly share our experiences and support each other as we learn. Our free forum membership is open to anyone working in philanthropy. If you happen to sneak in today and are not already a member, please join our community by signing up for membership at disabilityphilanthropy.org. This first this series is our first opportunity to build our community of practice. We look forward to learning together and to hearing from you about what works and what doesn't to advance your learning journey. We like to say that we're building the plane and flying it at the same time. Welcome aboard. Please let us know how we can continually improve. Before I introduce our moderator, I wanna highlight a few principles. First, disability is a natural part of the human experience and there are more than 60 million of us in the US alone. Disabilities can be apparent or non-apparent, lifelong or acquired, and disability is intersectional. We represent all aspects of diversity. Second, like other forms of oppression, the barriers to full participation in our society are socially constructed. To use an example of a physical disability, the problem is not that this wheelchair is too wide for the doorway, but rather the problem is that the doorway is too wide for the wheelchair. Finally, we recognize the founding disability rights and justice principle, nothing about us without us. Today, you'll hear from two disability justice leaders. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator for today, Naran Khan, a director in the Ford Foundation President's Office and fearless leader for disability inclusion and philanthropy. Naran will be joined by Sandy Ho for the, our first discussion and after the breakout rooms by Nikki Brown Booker of Borealis Philanthropies. Thank you and take it away, Naran. Fantastic, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, my name is Naran Khan and I use she and her pronouns. And um, I'm gonna just describe myself. I'm a brown Pakistani American woman with long brown hair, gold earrings, a black dress, it always reliably wear black. <laughs> and behind me is a white and cream bedroom um, with a lamp behind me and some gray artwork. So 
Um, and I come to you from the land of the Lenape, um, now Brooklyn, New York. I am so incredibly excited to kick off this conversation. Um, for myself, just because I find myself continuing to learn about disability inclusion and justice and rights. A couple of years into this work, I always find that I'm learning something. So I'm just grateful to be here to moderate, but also to learn from the incredible speakers we have today. Um, and I just, I wanna note for everyone here, kind of wherever you are in your journey, this work has been transformational for everything I do at Ford. I run our um, discretionary portfolio, which touches all different issues related to inequality and this work on, specifically on disability, has, it touches everything in all the communities that I work with more broadly. So whatever you come, whatever you bring to this uh, from the philanthropic perspective, I guarantee you being here and learning about disability-led organizations is going to strengthen what you do. Um, so I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here and uh, to see so many people uh, participating. Um, I have to say selfishly, I cherish and appreciate every conversation I have with Sandy Ho. I am so honored she's here today to have this conversation. And selfishly, I'm excited to get to ask her all the questions I have brewing in my mind. Um, and I'm really, really grateful we're going to have the chance to uh, pick the brains of all of you all here uh, and ask her and Nikki some really great questions. So um, very, very honored to be here with Sandy Ho. Hi, Sandy. How are you? Hi, Noran. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of taking off this Journey to Inclusion series. I'm delighted to be here. Fantastic. So maybe we um, maybe we just kind of get started. If you also just want to share your um, your pronouns and uh, self self ID description um, to to start us off, if that's okay. Sure. Um, my pronouns and I use are she hers, um, and I'm a disabled Asian American queer woman. Um, and so for my image description, I have um, short dark hair. I'm wearing uh, tortoise glasses. I have a yellow sweater on. Um, behind me is a pillow and a, a mat. Um, and I'm a disability policy researcher at Brandeis University. And I'm also the founder of the Disability and Intersectionality Summit. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I am presenting and living on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts tribe. Thanks. Thanks for sharing, Sandy. So let's start off with some terms because people throw around terms all the time and they're they're actually quite significant in the context of disability movement. So can you just define two terms for us in particular? What is disability rights and what is disability justice? And why is it important for funders to understand these two movements? Yeah, so I'm gonna try to keep it brief because if I'm being totally transparent, I can easily have an entire webinar series on these two terms alone. Um, so, but to begin, um, so disability rights, Really, um, this is a framework and movement that established, it promotes um, and protects the civil rights for disabled people. So very much this is a movement that is founded upon you know, the principles of equality before the law. Um, some of these um, civil rights include, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, Olmstead, um, IDEA, Section 504, um, and a slew of many others. Um, but so disability rights really began as a movement led by disabled people and their allies who began this work around the 60s um, in order for people with disabilities to have equal opportunities and the right to participate in our communities um, and to live. Um, and however, though, you know, despite these uh, legislations and these civil rights existing, we also know from um, social justice movements that equal access did not necessarily transfer to equity, right? And so in order to move equity forward and um, this notion of equal access and equal rights before the law also uh, prioritizes and privileges those who already do have the privilege of equality uh, before the law. And so, Disability justice is a different movement from disability rights. Um, it's a separate movement that really began around 2004, 2005, 
um, and its founders are um, disabled queers and activists of color who came from a place that recognizing that providing equal access and protections, um, although right, absolutely necessary, uh, but doesn't get to the systemic source of oppression that disabled people experience, and that is ableism. And so disability justice is really made up of 10 principles um, that you know, collectively um, strive towards collective liberation and also to address and dismantle ableism. Um, and in particular, you know, for marginalized disabled people um, whose equal access to equality is not just due to their disability status, but also because of the ways that they experience marginal marginalization and oppression um, at the intersections of race, race ethnicity, immigration status, um, carceral populations, LBGTQ, um, you know, the list goes on. But but the importance here is that um, these two movements are very distinct. Um, they are very separate. Um, and I would encourage folks to uh, check out Sins and Valid, um, the group that really um, behind disability justice. Um, there, I think that they recently um, published a second edition of the disability justice primer called Skin, Tooth and Bone, the basis of movement is our people. Um, so I just wanted to share that because again, like it could be an hours long lecture. Um, but to get to your second question though, about why is it important for funders to understand these two distinct movements? Um, it's because language matters. And I think that to know these two movements is also to know the history and culture of disability, past, present, and ongoing. Um, and so where our movements are going in the future is very much um, you know, disability informed and also um, should inform funding strategies. Um, so you know, this includes where are there areas of emerging work? Um, and I think that these two movements definitely have roles um, in answering some of these questions. And I would also add to that there, I think there's a misconception that just because there is the word disability in these two terms, disability justice and disability rights, this doesn't mean that it's only for the disability community or disabled people to be using them, right? And I think that it's important to understand these frameworks provide guidance for our strategies because disability intersects across all social justice areas and issues, but because, um, you know, disability rights has a place, for instance, in urban development and planning, in civic engagement, disability justice has a place and a voice and a role in environmental justice and transformative justice, racial justice, um, and the ways that we promote and appreciate the arts. And I'm sure that we're gonna hopefully talk about a lot of these, um, but so if funders are not acknowledging these two movements, then I think there's a loss to the strategy. There's a loss to, you know, who's at the table. Um, and, you know, it's an effective, you know, barring disabled people who experience discrimination um, and are under-resourced in funding areas. Um, but it's also a loss to just social justice and moving equity forward. And I hope that as brief as possible. It was it was fantastic and so rich, Sandy. And I think you planted a lot of seeds for further uh, for further exploration. And and just as someone who you know has heard you know these terms over time, I feel like re revisiting and reexamining them and reeducating oneself. It's an ongoing process. And so I just appreciate you kind of planting those seeds. When you mentioned some of the disability rights frameworks, you pointed to certain regulations. Um, and civil rights, um, you know, statutes that are really important. And I, I would just say to peers on this call, don't worry about all of the details just yet, dive in, but it's an invitation for further exploration. And there is such a rich and beautiful history built around what sounds like a very, you know, uh, orderly name of a regulation. There's just so much beauty and history um, and it's such a joy to dive into that. So. I think that was 
I'm grateful for that, Sandy, just to, to root us and ground us. I also want to note that Emily has kindly put in the chat the link to the principles of the 10 principles of disability justice from Sins Invalid. And um, we're going to be sharing great resources for folks to refer to afterwards. So do not worry. We're just taking it all in. <laughs> um, so the purpose of this particular webinar is to talk about disability led organizations. And um, again, we're back to terms like what is it? What do we mean by a disability led organization? And why is that so important, Sandy? Yeah, and again, I would point to the history of the disability movement, both in disability justice and disability rights work, where, you know, these movements um, were compelled because, in part, um, that disabled people did not have a voice or power um, in not just, you know, their day to day lives, but how do they um, come together in community? How do we um, get representation in democracy? Um, and so I think this question is really about power. Um, so when I think about disability -like organizations, as an example, you know, I think about when organizations tell me how they had uh, people with disabilities as members of their board, right, for instance. Um, but then my, my follow up question is always, well, do they also have voting power? Or do they have access to the information about the decisions that are being discussed? And you know, are they also contributing um, or have pathways to, to be able to contribute um, to the decisions and the power that you know, the board members are, are also discussing? Um, so disability-led organization to me really means, you know, it's power meaningfully held by disabled people and not just as advisory board members or external you know project consultants but as really a part of the internal organizational culture and also just the structure um and you know i i would point to one of the principles of the disability justice framework which is leadership of those most impacted and so if we look to this principle for guidance in this question um i think that this is about recognizing that as a framework to address ableism and as a source of oppression, then the solutions, the strategies, the pathways must then be informed by disabled people themselves, right? The people who most experience this injustice. And so I think this question also really brings, um, calls to attention the legacy of disability organizations, you know, many of which began as charities um, to find a cure or to bring awareness, but Many also continue to be led by predominantly non-disabled people, um, for instance, parents and other allies. And I think there's still this need to push for disability-led organizations um, to combat some of you know, the stereotypes, the discrimination, um, but really it all comes back to this, to this source of power. So helpful, Sandy. And so let's just say I'm a program officer working on policing or I'm a program officer funding climate justice. Mm -hmm. And I know in my heart of hearts that I've got to consult with um, the disability community and disability led organizations. What are key types of organizations that are important to connect with? And you know, where do you find networks of disabled people to engage with? I know that sounds like such a you know funky question to ask, but I mean, I think that's where we start. Like, where, like, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, where, where do folks start? Whatever your issue area, how do you find folks to connect with, consult with, and share space with? Yeah. So, so yeah, like you said, this is kind of a weird question, especially for somebody who has only been in this sphere in my entire career, my entire life. So, like, my gut instinct is, well, every disability organization is a key organization, right? But um, that being said, there are um, like Centers for Independent Living in every state, um, Developmental Disabilities Councils. Um, there, are, for instance, are like Governor's Committee. Sandy, can I interrupt? What's the Center for Independent Living? Sure. Um, so this is um, an organization um, that exists um, in every state. And it is, I mean, it depends on the Center for Independent Living, but broadly speaking, um, the majority of the staff at CILs, uh, the abbreviation, um, are people with disabilities. 
um, but they provide, you know, for instance, when I look at the Center for Independent Living that I'm most connected with, Boston Center for Independent Living in Massachusetts, you know, they're providing folks with on the ground access to PPE, to personal care attendant services. They have youth leadership programs. Um, it, it's a whole variety. I mean, they, they're also working with folks to um, access for housing, for employment. Um, so yeah, Centers for Independent Living are very much for, like I view them as among the front lines of the organizations. Um, and so then we also have youth leadership forums. Um, you know, these are conferences um, that work with youth who are in transition age. Um, so for instance, I was a past mentor at a youth leadership forum. And this is a conference where young people who are transitioning from high school um, into college or uh, you know, into their first apartment, um, get connected with you know, other disabled adults um, who have been there and done that. Um, and, and so many of these organizations um, that currently exist, and when I think the organizations, I think like brick and mortar structure, right, um, have their or origins as part of the independent living movement, which, as I mentioned earlier, really started in the 60s. So many have been around for decades. Then we also have an emerging group of disability justice um, work. And although might not have, um, you know, the same visibility and um, like history to them are so very much present in um, our society and in our advocacy and a movement work. Um, so when I think about you know, your second question to this, which was like, where do we find uh, networks of people with disabilities? Um, that's such a broad question because I'm thinking about, you know, there are networks where students with disabilities are connecting with one another, right? But there are also networks of parents with disabilities. Um, so there's also, when we look at the response, for instance, from the wildfires in California, I mean, this was mutual aid groups are also a network of disabled people um, providing on the ground um, access to, to food and um, PPE and emergency necessities to disabled and elderly folks. Um, and so when we think about networks, I also would wanna say how important it is to go beyond the brick and mortar structures because many of these networks outside um, are vital and are, are very much doing the frontline work. Fantastic. So much of what you said resonated. And I think what I'm hearing from you is disabled people are everywhere. You know, there's going to be really emerging networks that are digital, which are also amazing. And I'll just say from my own experience, like I was, I started following all these people on Twitter that I started DMing them. I mean, this is like four or five years ago. Like I was making friends with people online. Like, you know, you just kind of put yourself out there and the networks are there. You just have to seek them out. Um, and, and be a little mindful, like we're in philanthropy, you don't get free advice, that's not appropriate. How can you appropriately engage and consult with people um, in a way that honors their labor and, uh, and compensates them as well? So I, I really appreciate that, but I think, I think there's, yeah, there's the brick and mortar, there's the digital, there, you know, the people are everywhere. <laughs> like, I think that's, that's the, uh, what, what you were getting to. Um, Let's talk about the diversity in the disability community that Emily alluded to in the introduction, which is, you know, people with disabilities have diverse disabilities. Um, let's talk specifically about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. What can we do to ensure that they play meaningful roles in either your consultation and your own organizations and the work you do? Um, do you have any advice about that? Yeah, and I just wanted to um, go back to your point. Like, absolutely. I this is embarrassing that I like completely forgot about the hashtag networks of disabled people. Um, and this also is a reflection of how much of a noob I am on Twitter. But yes, I mean, hashtag um, and the digital advocacy um, of disabled people um, on Twitter is like every day I'm learning new things. Um, but with, so about the, this next question, um, working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I first want to say that I'm not somebody who identifies um, as a person with an intellectual um, disability. 
Um, however, so, you know, in my own community organizing work, in my own disability policy research work, I'm looking to my friends and leaders who are people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, for their guidance. Um, but just sort of, you know, some of the key lessons that I've learned from them over time is get the need for plain language documents. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, well, you know, in disability policy, like academia, for instance, like we are notoriously infamous for producing like these ridiculous 45, 50 page reports with like graphs and tables and analyses that honestly no one actually has time for to read, right? And and plain language documents, it's not, um, I wanna say here and now, it's like not a, like a simplified version of that. It isn't about, you know, like reframing the information, but it's getting at like what is succinct and what is necessary, um, for instance, for somebody to go to the Hill to advocate and talk to their legislative representative. Um, plain language documents are also a way to provide like, accessible information for everybody. Um, so when we're talking about, you know, that earlier example I shared of um, people at a board meeting, um, like are there multiple formats of the documents on these reports available? So that would be one um, learning uh, that I've, I've taken away from, from my work. And then also it's really important to learn about the People First Movement and the self-advocacy groups um, that exist across the country and are some of the most diverse across um, you know, identities and race, ethnicity and sexuality that I've like had the privilege of listening to their events. Um, Sandy, can I just interrupt and say, what do you mean by people first movements and what is self-advocacy? Sure, so um, some folks here in the audience might have heard about the debate between um, identity first and, and people first language. And um, you know, people first movement is really um, a movement that was founded and led by um, self-advocates and our, people with intellectual disabilities. Um, one group would be self-advocates becoming empowered, for instance. Um, like I'm looking to, to their leadership constantly. Um, and this, this is a movement that within the disability movement itself, um, you know, has their own history and their, their own um, ways of advocacy and also you know, are not, um, consistently a part of disability rights and disability justice work in conversation. Um, and I think a part of that is because of the lack of accessibility to the information. Um, so the other um, point that I would like to make about, about um, getting involved and learning more from people with intellectual disabilities too is like going and attending their events that are being led by um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Like, there isn't really a cookie cutter approach to movement work in general. And I think, you know, we know that um, across all movements. And I think that when we take that approach with the disability community, what happens is that we perpetuate this pattern of, of having the same group of voices at the table. And that's something that, you know, I would challenge um, like this audience to, to move beyond. Um, and I think like a part of learning from and, and getting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities more involved is like getting to know our community. Um, yeah. Fantastic, thank you, Sandy. Um, so, okay, I think we, you've heard it, folks hear this. Uh, we can't find people with disabilities to speak with, like, you know, people, people saying like, it's not our fault, we didn't include people, like there, weren't, there wasn't anyone. How do you respond to that? Um, that's always so frustrating and disappointing to hear. And hopefully yeah. nobody in this audience is gonna come away with that ever again. Um, yeah. But I will say, you know, like here we are. <laughs> um, and I think part of this is, you know, I realize that in our day-to-day -day jobs and roles that we all have and the hours that we are limited to, like we can't necessarily always spend our time like building relationships and, and cultivating them in the ways that they really deserve to be. Um, but I, I can't stress that enough. 
um, that how important that is. You know, like I, I look at the ways that you shared earlier about the ways that you, you know, put yourself out there and like um, you know, DM people on Twitter. Um, so when I hear folks saying, you know, we can't find a disabled person of color for this panel, um, that's really more reflective of their approach than the disability community. And so it's, it's disheartening, it's frustrating because I think disability community is really tired um, of being the fire extinguishers, right? So like constantly having to put out the fires or, or doing the, um, the cleanup work because you know there was a report or there was a call for a grant or something that didn't include disability in some way. And then, you know, we get called into uh, these conversations and it's like this constant cycle that not only is limiting to that funder's work, but it's also limiting because as disabled people, like we have our own work and our own, um, you know, disability justice work, disability rights legislation to be pushing forward and to ask us to be doing both constantly at the same time. Um, well, I mean, burnout is like an understatement, but um, yeah. What is it? What does it mean to truly consult with a community? Like what is so say you don't you don't get the report afterwards and then suddenly this like very critical community is not included in the report or the subject matter area. Like if you were to start from the beginning, like what is a good consultation look like? Yeah, so I would say that when disabled people are not treated as window dressing on diversity panels or awareness days, like I think that is the bare minimum at this point. Um, but to realize that also disabled people are not just here to respond to everyone else's breaking news or latest issues, right? Like we're not here to clean up all of the disability faux pas constantly. Um, and so I think to consult meaningfully, I mean, that we are building relationships in meaningful ways. If I were to take um, a page out of my community organizer book, for instance, to share, whenever I, before I reach out to somebody who I'm like, I want this person to fill out the call for proposals for the intersectionality summit. Before I do, I go to their organization events page or I check out their Twitter and I try to figure out like what has been going on in their realm of the world and then engage in a conversation from there. Um, and I think that as funders um, coming from this place, recognizing that well, as funders, we're not the experts always in disability justice and disability rights work. I mean, I say that as myself who had, you know, been doing this work. So um, coming from a place of learning um, and being able to recognize that by distributing power to disabled communities and to these two movements, um, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to go to an event when you're not presenting at where we're just listening. Yeah. <laughs> Sandy, I have to interrupt and say, like, that is like one of my key takeaways is don't invite disabled people to your spaces for your meeting. I mean, it's fine, do that. But the places where I've learned the most is where I show up and I am immersed in a new culture, a new space, new norms, new ways of operating, new ideas. And to me, that means showing up um, at other people's conferences, meetings, spaces, you know, disability led organizations, like those have been the most transformational meetings for me where I've been like, uh, like very, very heavily influenced in my thinking and ways of operating. So that I just, I had to interrupt and say like that resonates so deeply with me. And like, stop only showing up to places where you speak people, come on. I just have to be honest about that. <laughs> um, okay, I promised Emily Harris, I would only go two minutes over. Um, and we have like so much to tackle, but I have to say, um, and, and I hope folks are following the chat um, and the chat has certain secret information to which you all have access as members of the, the Disability and Philanthropy Forum. You all have access to this as members and it's really fantastic custom materials. So please keep an eye on what Emily Ledow and others are posting there. Um, okay, so Borealis, Borealis Philanthropy, uh, has this incredible participatory fund uh, focused on um, dis the disability, the US disability movement. 
And Sandy, you were uh, tasked with doing some of the landscaping prior to that fund determining its priorities. Um, can you share some of your key findings for that really important work you did in uh, embodying nothing about us without us, talking to other activists, and really shaping uh, uh, priorities of this like first ever and very influential fund? Yeah. Um, so first off, like I loved working with the Disability Inclusion Fund team. Um, Nikki and Kayla were just a delight. Um, but yeah, so the, the question that came to me was, was really like, hey, you know, we are launching this portfolio, but we need help figuring out how to structure our grants, what kind of grants would be most impactful into the field. Um, and so recognizing that disability rights and disability justice movement work looks differently geographically. Um, I talked with um, 12 folks, I think, eight people from across the country who um, do identify as disabled people and predominant, and the majority were disabled people of color. Um, and so what we learned was that, you know, disability rights and disability justice fields continues to be under-resourced, particularly those who are led by um, disabled people of color um, and marginalized disabled people. Um, and while, you know, the, the movement's work and disabled people are committed to ensuring that our, our community and this movement is lasting. Many emerging groups in the field do not have the capacity uh, or the tools necessarily to approach funders or have the know-how to navigate grantsmanship. Right? That's a privilege that comes with like previous professional experiences. But I think that what is most apparent from this landscape analysis is that um, these two movements are very acutely aware of the power dynamics, not just in the relationship between funders and movement work, but also it's really reflective of where disabled people are in our broader society as a whole. Whether we're talking about rates of poverty and disability community or representation in public office. Um, and so I think that the landscape analysis showed that disabled people were BIPOC, um, you know, while contributing to the field in some of the most innovative and, um, you know, really like just carrying the, the labor and the bulk of the work, um, the capacity to do both the necessary frontline grassroots work and also the time to like build out their day-to-day -day operations. It's just not something that they are equipped to do. Sandy, everyone here has access to your landscaping on the forum. So that's just another, that's just like another thing I wanna highlight. Okay, we are well over time. Um, I want to say as we transition to breakout rooms, I want to mention that afterwards we're going to be taking the questions that get surfaced in the breakout rooms um, to uh, to uh, both Sandy and Nikki Brown Booker, um, who will also be able to talk about the participatory process of the Disability Inclusion Fund at Borealis. So, um, so think about the questions you have. We'll be able to elevate them there. I have to soak this up. This is like a really incredible moment when we have like you know, close to 70 people here for a conversation of this kind. I'm so excited and very excited about the amazing facilitators we have in the breakout. So stick with us. This is going to be a lot of fun and very, very fruitful. So I think we will uh, just turn it right over to Naran. Fantastic. We have the absolute juiciest questions. I don't know how we're going to deal with this. Actually, I do know we're going to tackle as many as we can with um, with Sandy and Nikki here, and then we will use the rest for fodder for content we produce for the forum and for other places. So please know, whatever was elevated and surfaced today, we'll be able to answer in other ways. Uh, the Disability and Philanthropy Forum and other folks here. So please know this is this is a really great way for us to know what's on your collective mind. Um, may I? introduce Nikki Brown Booker for just a moment. Nikki, can you just say hello and, and share a little bit more about yourself for, for a moment before we get started? Sure. Thanks, Naran. So I'm Nikki Brown Booker, and I'm the program officer for the Disability Inclusion Fund. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm um, a brown woman wearing glasses with curly uh, black hair, and I have on a a uh, multicolored blue gray dress and in my background there's uh, a picture of my partner's dog on the beach so um 
And I'm just really excited to be here and to talk more about the fund. And um, and there's so many juicy questions. We can hardly wait to get to them. Fantastic. And a reminder to everyone, I mean, this is an intimate space. So let's keep the answers and conversation here just amongst ourselves and not more broadly public uh, so we can really get into the details. So maybe I'll go first asking both Nikki and um, and Sandy. I, you know, like I'm a well-meaning person. I care about social justice. I care about equity. Um, what if I mess up? Like what if I mess up in engaging with disability-led organizations, with the community? Um, should I be worried? Should that mean I should wait to learn more before I engage? What's the vibe here? Nikki, you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, we're all human, so it's okay to mess up. It's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. And I think uh, it's really important that uh, you, you do some of your own education and that there's really great resources out there to educate yourself on um, the disability community um, and um, disability justice. I mean, I would definitely um, read through uh, lands, uh, the landscape analysis that Sandy put together to really talk, that really talks about what's going on um, at the grassroots level for disability organizations and philanthropy. Um, and, you know, that there are great organizations out there doing a lot of uh, disability training on um, what, uh, on, on, like, you know, one of our grantees actually does a disability 101 training, which is really fabulous. Sandy, do you have more to add? Yeah, um, you know, I think Nikki captures it really great. Um, so I think that, you know, like I said earlier, um, these movements have been around since the 60s. Um, disability justice movement, you know, been around since the mid 2000s. Um, so these resources exist and many as we shared them um, in the chat today and you, know, you all have access to it um, as members of the forum. So um, I think that it's okay to mess up but also being transparent about like, okay, how do we um, rectify the issue and how do we prevent that mistake from happening again? Fantastic, thank you. So, okay, today's topic was engaging with disability-led organizations. Are non-disability-led organizations that focus on disability, parent organizations or other organizations, are they bad? Should you not engage? Like, what is, what is the approach here? So I think that, um, you know, you know, disability is intersectional and in that, you know, there's disability in all parts of, in every type of organization. I think sometimes people don't even realize that there are people with disabilities within the organization themselves. But, um, you know, we focus on dis we focus on giving, gra giving grants to disability large organizations, but there are so many, um, you know, people and organizations that have real value and that, and that um, the work they do is really important. But, you know, we always wanna like make sure that they're think coming from, that they're thinking about disability from, from a perspective that is um, really inclusive of people with disabilities. Yeah, um, I think that when it comes to organizations that are not disability led, it's also a, a reflection of kind of like where we are as a society and a country in terms of disability um, movement and power. And I think that, you know, as um, disability communities are gaining in um, the ways that, you know, we have opportunities to, um, you know, gain leadership in, in other areas of, of our society, like this, this is also an opportunity for organizations to um, undergo these shifts and evolutions as well. Thank you. Um, what's the history in terms of the evolution of language related to disability? Do you want to answer that, Sandy? Yeah. Um, um, so I think that, you know, when it comes to language, this is again, like it could be its own class. Um, but even 
I'm constantly learning about the disability language. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, for instance, when I was talking earlier about um, identity first um, versus people first movement, um, you know, just like in general, like day to day operations and things that we're doing in our lives, like mm -hmm. I always just ask people how do they identify and like how, mm -hmm. what is the preference. Um, but in terms of like the evolution of language, I look to the ways that um, there are many disabled people who also reclaim the word crip um, from, from cripple, which mm -hmm. you know, at like at a certain point in our history that was considered a slur. Um, mm -hmm. And um, you know, in the ways that we have politicized um, the, re the reclamation of certain language um, and the ways that it gets used in disability community. Um, so the evolution of language is constantly happening. And um, I think that what I really appreciate about disability justice principles and that framework is mm -hmm. that it provides a space for that growth, for the movement to do. Maybe I would wanted to add. Yeah, I think you covered it pretty well. You guys are the best tag team. This is great. Okay, I'm going to just keep going. Um, so how, how do we as funders build authentic power and support it in the organizations and individuals we support? Do you have any insights on that? Well, I mean, I really think it's important that philanthropy, I feel like I feel like philanthropy is in a lot of ways not thought about, has not been very thoughtful on how they support disability organizations and how they fund disability. Like in a lot of ways, it's always, to me, feels like it's always the last thing that gets funded or, um, or, or, it's, or they're funding like the kind of the very large organizations that kind of like, there seems like there's like the 10 organizations that always get funded. You know, what we're, what we're doing, I think, really different with the Disability Inclusion Fund is that we're really focusing on supporting grassroots organizations that are disability-led and BIPOC-led and really building power at the grassroots level, which is so important. And um, because as Sandy discussed earlier, those organizations are really under-resourced. And um, in order for us to really support disability justice kind of coming out, being becoming a, a bigger concept and intersecting with other movements, we have to find ways to support them um, through our grant making. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have anything to add to that. And it's also, you know, like knowing that Nikki and her team at the Disability Inclusion Fund are really the ones like doing this work currently. So, um, yeah. There we go. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Okay, so let's just look beyond usual suspects and and find nascent organizations and individuals and people trying to build things. Um, also check out the roster of the amazing grantees of the Disability Inclusion Fund. Okay, uh, how do we have conversations about ableism beyond accessibility? Yeah, I think that this is really important because again, you know, when I was doing um, the landscape analysis work. A lot of the grantees, or I mean, the the folks that I was talking with um, to do this project, you know, they were constantly trying to tell me that like we need to move beyond the ramps and the elevators and the toolkits. Like, you know, there's like I was talking about earlier, there isn't really a cookie cutter approach to this movement work. And when we talk about ableism, um, I look to the the ways that disability justice and the principles work together to dismantle um, and address ableism as a source of oppression that not only you know, impacts disabled bodies and people, but you know, really cuts across race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, immigrant status, um, LGBTQ communities. So when we talk about ableism, again, you know, it, this isn't just a framework or a set of tools for disabled people and the people who are working with disability communities. It really should be um, further addressed in, in other social movements and strategies as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why um, we really uh, were looking to support um, organizations that were doing cross movement building so that, you know, it, it moves beyond just uh, uh, the 
uh, organizations with disability because it's the intersectionality is so important and such an important part of the work that needs to be done and so that we really need to support um, cross movement building and that will actually by doing that we're really breaking down some of the uh, the structures of ableism and how people you know so the more we can communicate with each other the better thanks nikki um what to help build the capacity of grantees that don't currently have a disability lens and kind of how does that overlap with the idea of like disability led organizations and networks Oh, this is a great question. <laughs> so, um, I think I think that there are the capacity building is so important um, in grant making because you know not only are disability organizations severely under resourced, um, but it in that under resourced it makes it difficult for them to really interact with uh, do movement building and interact with other uh, groups and organizations and that I think it's just super important that we really build out the capacity of many of the of the groups you know our when we were doing our grant making we were really focused on resourcing organizations throughout the entire country and you know um, particularly, we want to focus on under-resourced um, or um, uh, uh, like uh, the so we did a lot of grant making in the southern part of the country as well as the Midwest, and um, and also we really wanted to uh, we we want we really focus on organizations that had small budgets that really. Um, really needed to wanted to really develop their work that was like super important i think you might, might add something to that sandy um yeah i, I mean i think you, you gave a great overview of that and and i would just add that in order for you know grantee capacity to expand i think it's first also important that funders themselves like when they're talking with their grantees um have a grasp of the ways that the priorities and issue areas that are important to disability rights and disability justice movements right now are, um, you know, also impacting youth um, funding strategies or environmental justice funding strategies or uh, racial justice. Um, because, again, I think like when we talk about disability within the context of broader social justice and cross movement funding strategies that um, Nikki was talking about earlier. Um, I think it helps grantees kind of better understand like, oh, well, this population isn't just limited to what I initially thought. It is also inclusive of disabled people. This chat is fire. Like if you guys have had a chance to look at what's going on in the chat, it's fantastic. And I really encourage everyone to take a peek. Um, such a compliment to the amazing insights we have from, from Nikki and Sandy here. Um, okay, this is a very good question. I'm very excited about it. Okay, so what are the potential biases that creep into philanthropy in connecting with disability-led organizations? You do not need to sugarcoat anything because I'm sure you guys have been with organizations seeking money before. You guys have been on various ends of the funding side. Like what truly are the biases that creep into this work that would prevent someone from truly engaging with a disability-led organization? Oh, there's so much. <laughs> Cover it all. We have the time. You know, we've got like nine minutes left. We're going to take advantage of this. I, you know, one thing that, so, you know, before I joined philanthropy, I was a former executive director and it was so hard to find grants that weren't just focused on like medical uh, or medical research or, um, or like social services type funding, which is you know obviously really important, but um, philanthropy was not supporting organizations that were doing movement building. They weren't supporting organizations that were uh, disability led, doing um, art uh, that they you know they weren't supporting um, anything that wasn't like to me. It was like 
either you were employment related or medical research related. <laughs> and there, there's such a huge broad spectrum of disability organizations out there doing so many different and interesting work. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, funding for or organizations doing mental health work uh, that was not focused on, um, you know, hospitalizations, but just, just, just a big, there's a huge broad range of, of, of organizations out there just doing really great work. And philanthropy was just focused on just very small slice of the work that was being, that is being done and was being done. And, um, you know, that was one of the reasons why we really wanted to really broaden what we, we saw as, uh, as disability work and then and really focusing on disability led organizations. Thanks, Nikki. Sandy, anything to add? Um, yeah, a, a few points. I think what, you know, one of the biases that is constantly being run up against is the presumption that, um, for instance, in order for uh, funders to, um, you know, resource an area that the data needs to be there, um, you know, to sort of justify um, these funds for, for this, whatever issue it might be. And I think that for many in community, um, organizations may or may not have the capacity or, you know, the tools necessary to collect their own data, mm -hmm. to work with their own data, to, you know, provide and analyze it. And instead, you know, funders might be encouraging folks to uh, partner with a university organization or, or, you know, a more critical data researchy type of place. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is also a question of power and building the capacity of disability organizations to really own and, and like do this work. It also means giving us and expanding our capacity to work with our own data and to collect it in ways that are meaningful and reflective of the community that we come from. Um, so that, that's just one point. And also I think, you know, disability rights and disability justice movements are both fairly young. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, one of our, the Americans with Disabilities Act just only recently turned 30. Um, and you know, the disability justice movement, you know, it's been around since 2004, 2005. And I think one of the things that is a bias is the funders have kind of like their like predetermined like scope of work or you know like what they're funding and there isn't a lot of flexibility to grow necessarily so um you know say a grantee is doing this work that you know they're being resourced for but then need you know the time and the the space to do the reflection work of like okay what was the impact what was the learning that we could take away from what we just did um and i'm not sure for that like that's always available uh for grants yeah mm -hmm. yeah i actually I just wanted to add a little bit more to that is in um you know when you're dealing with an under resource group uh you know multi-year um, grant making is so important to them so that they can really have the time and to really um to do some of the the things that um, Sandy was talking about, like really learning, learn and supporting um, evaluation, like you know, giving grant making dollars specifically for doing um, you know evaluation work, or um, and not just for program programmatic work and to, for uh, supporting organizations doing policy work and um, all those things that uh -huh. are important to the community. Yeah, so multi-year support, sufficient overhead such that people, you know, in, in particular when it comes to accessibility, people love to squeeze as little overhead as possible, not recognizing that that, that has an impact on who is served where. Um, okay, oh, so many good questions. I'm going to keep racing through them in the four minutes we have left. How do we challenge ableism when donors may be uncomfortable with disabled people in the driver's seat? And this kind of gets to the core of risk averse donors. Like, you know, how do how do we stand up to that? Nikki, I think you can you can tackle it. <laughs> um, well, I would say fund them. <laughs> there's no re there's no reason not to, right? I, I to me, I just don't see. I don't. 
I don't under, I don't get the justification for not funding a smaller grassroots organization um, and really supporting them to do the work that they they need to to do that's so important to the community, not just to the disability community, but to the you know community at large, and um, and just because they're young or new or 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 that they are led by people with disabilities, that I, that I mean, that's that to me that's able. If you're not supporting them, that you're really buying into the whole idea of ableism that they're they're unable to really uh, do the work. So I don't know if you have one. I, have I love it. I just have to say, like Nikki, like I think we could have ended that answer at just like fund them, but the elaboration was helpful. Um, Sandy, anything else? No, I mean I'm totally wondering yeah. what if, what Nikki just said. Fund them. Great, love it. Okay, allies and friends lead too much. Guilty. Um, how do we ensure disabled people themselves should lead? And we've touched upon this before, but just like really getting at the core of the question, like maybe even to expand that, like what is the role of allies, friends, supporters, and what does it mean to shift the power and also have disabled folks leading? So I'm just gonna use this um, webinar as an example because I wish that this was a space and event that happened across every sector. Um, because I think one thing that allies do and like what was so brilliant in this webinar structure today is that you know it can, it's about convening the folks who already know that they have the work to do and that they can grow in the space and learn more, um, but then have you know, people from the field such as Nikki and myself um, talking and, and doing so in a way that um, is really about listening rather than kind of just like listening for X, Y, Z bottom line, um, but just sort of really hearing and learning from what we're sharing. I also, um, so, you know, we're doing a participatory grant making model and I, I really want I really believe that it's like nothing about us without us. And that if you are, um, you know, a foundation wanting to do disability funding that you really need to have people with disabilities in the, in the, in the, at the power structure of making some of those decisions and of really thinking through um, and not coming from the outside, thinking about what, what the disability community needs, but actually, uh, having people with disabilities on your grant making committees on your staff in your um, in your foundations um, and and that they're actually in at, at, at the source of the power of, of making the, of decisions thank you both so very much this is like so amazing for me I mean there I know there's a lot of other people here this wasn't just about that but I really soaked this up. I have so much gratitude to you, Sandy and Nikki, for your thoughtfulness, graciousness, and openness to have this conversation. Um, I want to thank everyone who's here. I'm going to actually kick it over to Emily Harris in just like one second, but I have to say something, which is um, we are trying to build something. We're trying to build a community and a space for people, whether or not you explicitly work on disability rights, like it's on all of us to create a community of practice in our sector in philanthropy, which has done, uh, which has not only ignored disability, it has actually perpetuated some really um, challenging and dangerous tropes about this, this issue as well. And so I just wanna kindly say to everyone here, please email four or five of your colleagues in philanthropy, whether at, they're at your foundation or somewhere else and tell them to join the forum. Register, like put in your email, make up a password and then have access to all of this information. It is free. We're so thrilled to be able to share it with folks. We have original, incredible content that's custom made for our sector. And it doesn't matter what we do if people don't read it, consume it, appreciate it respond to it and change their practices because of it. So I, I just, I almost am begging you, I am begging you, please share it with friends and colleagues. It would mean so much. It would be so powerful to have a ripple effect in our sector. So gratitude to all of you. 
so grateful to be here. Very excited. Thank you all so much. Emily Harris, you're going to wrap us up. If I can find my mouse to get off mute. Um, thank you, Naran. Thank you, Nikki, Sandy. I, I can't wait to watch everything again and hear all of the wisdom that you shared. It's just been incredible. In addition to the forum, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, uh, commercial Naran, Emily Ledow has posted our social media cha um, channels in chat. Please join us in that way as well. Although we do ask that this conversation be kept um, confidential. We um, will be sending you a survey. Please help us learn from your experience by taking a few minutes to fill it out. Um, and uh, I think there will be a link. Yes, there is a link in the chat as well. Join us as we, we continue this learning session uh, series. We have three additional um, sessions coming up in this same format, one on disability language, uh, one on demographic tracking and self-identification, and one on human resources and employee participation. Uh, we also have our disability and philanthropy series on intersections. Uh, the next one coming up is in April on health equity and disability. So I am so excited about all of the conversations that have happened today. We look forward to continuing them with you. Join us, please sign up for the forum and uh, don't forget to come back uh, early and often to see what new, new resources we are posting continually. There were a million questions not covered today. We will be doing our best to address them. Feel free to reach out through, uh, through the forum if there are specific questions that you don't see answers to, and we'll do our best to get back to you. Thank you and uh, look forward to seeing you in May uh, to talk more about disability language. And thanks one more time to our incredible panelists and all of our breakout room facilitators who volunteered their time today. I uh, look forward to seeing you soon.